Yes. Five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to Up in Your Business with Kerry McCoy, a production of FlagandBanner.com. Through storytelling and conversational interviews, this weekly radio show offers listeners firsthand insight in starting and running a business, the ups and downs of risk taking, and the commonalities of successful people. Connect with Carrie through her candid, often funny, and informative weekly blog, where you'll read and comment on life as wife, mother, daughter, and entrepreneur. And now it's time for Carrie McCoy to get all up in your business. Thank you, Jason. Like Jason said, I'm Carrie McCoy, and it's time for me to get up in your business. Did everybody hear us get off to a rocky start, Jason? Or uh, not? Just a minute ago. I don't think so. Yeah, well, I just want to tell everybody, we've been out for the last few weeks. We've had life, and we're back here for the first time in a few weeks. And it was we were, like, trying to plug stuff in, and we're scurrying around. If you're watching us on Facebook, you probably saw all that hecticness. But before we start, I want to introduce my co-host, who you just heard from, Jason Malik from Arise Studio in Conway, Arkansas. Say hello, Jason. Hi, Carrie. If right now you're sitting at your computer, you might want to watch us live so you can watch the clown, us clowning around. Uh, we're at flagandbanner.com's Facebook page. It's kind of fun to see what goes on behind the scenes and at the breaks as it happens in real time. If for some reason you miss any part of this show today or want to hear it again or you want to share it, there's a way. And Jason will tell you how. Listen to all UIYB past and present interviews by going to flagandbanner.com and clicking on radio show. There you may join our email list or like us on Facebook, thus getting a reminder notification of the day of the show and a sneak peek of that day's guest. And if you'd like to be an underwriter of any UIYB shows, send an email to marketing at flagandbanner.com. That's marketing at flagandbanner.com. Back to you, Carrie. Thank you, Jason. If you're tuning into this broadcast for the first time, welcome. And if you're a returning fan, you probably know this next part by heart. But at the risk of being boring, we must repeat ourselves for our new customers. And besides that, it gives my guests a chance to settle in to their seat. This show, Up in Your Business with Carrie McCoy, began as a platform for me, a small business owner and a guest, to pay forward our experiential knowledge in a conversational way. Originally, my team and I thought it would speak to entrepreneurs and want to be entrepreneurs, but it seems to have a wider audience appeal because after all, who isn't inspired by everyday people's American-made stories? To see people in their totality is humanizing. We all thirst to connect and make sense of an overcomplicated world, and on this show, we have the luxury of time to go deeper than a mere soundbite or headline. And my favorite part, we always learn something. It's no secret that success Successful people work hard, but other common traits found in many of my guests are the heart of a teacher, belief in a higher power, and creativity, because business in of itself is creative. And what my guest today does today takes a lot of creativity. My guest today is Dr. Chris Shoemake, a renowned plastic and reconstructive surgeon in Little Rock, Arkansas. Chris is a Pine Bluff, Arkansas native. And I told him before the show, I'm amazed at how many of my guests come from Pine Bluff. What's mm -hmm. up down there? Got something special in the water? Uh, must be the paper mill down there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he got his bachelor's degree from Hendricks College in Conway, Arkansas, then went on to medical school at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. After that, he did eight years of residency training, first at UAMS in general surgery, Next, he did his plastic surgery and reconstruction residency at the University of Texas. And last, he moved to California and worked with young and old persons affected by facial birth defects at UCLA. That must have been very rewarding. Thanks. In 1992, Dr. Shoemake returned to Arkansas as chief of plastic surgery at UAMS and Arkansas Children's Hospital. In 1996, the good doctor took the entrepreneurial leap just four years later and entered private practice. The reason for Dr. Shoemake's huge success and long wait list for surgery is not just because of his experience and deep knowledge, although he has that, but also because he has a reputation for creating a natural and youthful look in his patient's appearance. Today, we're going to find out what it's like to be a plastic surgeon and get down to the nitty gritty of facelifts, skin tight, cool sculpting, injections, 
acne and scar repair, breast augmentation, and more. We'll talk about the latest procedures and trends, alternatives to going under the knife, and get his opinion on where he thinks you get the most bang for your bucks in cosmetic surgery. And last, I'll ask the proverbial question, are facelifts passe? I don't think they're passe, but we'll get that. to that. Yeah. It is a pleasure to welcome to the table a well-respected expert in his field, plastic surgeon and helicopter pilot, <laughs> Dr. Yeah. Chris Schumacher. <laughs> you can't just find that out on anywhere. Else. Uh, <laughs> Only I know that. Yeah. Before we get into your early life, let's go ahead and ask the question, because there are so many options for women today are face, that you can do besides facelifts. Mm -hmm. Why do you still believe in them? Well, I think the... Um, we don't have yet a way to non-surgically tighten the skin like we can with a facelift. <clears throat> so there may be something that comes up. We're, we're approaching that. You know, the whole non-surgical side of, of aesthetic surgery or aesthetic medicine has um, made it so that we can, we can tighten skin somewhat, but not to the degree and not in the, it's not directional like you can in a facelift. So I think we're, we're, Probably 20% there, but there may be a day when we can, you know, find a cream that you can rub on that'll tighten your skin. Wouldn't you know? that be nice? Yeah. That is a huge industry. I just want to be the one to invent that. That's yeah, what. <laughs> right. It was your father a doctor? Nope. No. Nope. My father was uh, worked for the Corps of Engineers in Pine Bluff, worked on Lock and Dam 4. Really? Mm -hmm. Did you always want to be a doctor? You know, I found a, um, a little autobiography that I wrote when I was 13. My mom passed away and I was looking through her stuff and she saved, she was the, the first hoarder, I think. She saved everything. Got my first color crayon mark on a thing. And I found this little autobiography and, and I was 13 and, it, and I, I, I wrote in there that when I grow up, I want to be a doctor. Um, I think I've had a lot of, uh, you know, once once you tell your mom that you want to be a doctor, even if it's 13, then then you're locked in, you know, <laughs> you, you uh, because I didn't want to disappoint her, but I, I love it. And uh, I was fortunate when I was growing up to have strong mentors in, in that area. My, after my dad died, my mom, I was an only child, and my mom could not talk about the birds and the bees. She was just in that generation. She couldn't mm -hmm. talk to me about it. So our pediatrician from Pine Bluff, Tom Ed Townsend, um, rest his soul, <clears throat> um, she called him and said, hey, can you talk to my son about about?" The birds and the bees, and he's 14 now, and and uh, so I rode my bike over to his office, and he was inevitably late with his patients. So you know, I was just sitting out in the waiting room, and his nurse, Miss Sammy, came in and got me, and and so he, he said, "Well, I can't, we can't do it right now, but why don't you just hang out with me and and see these patients?" And so I would go in and see all these patients with him. This was back in the days before HIPAA, you know, this was in the 60s, um, <clears throat> and he would introduce me as his young protege, you know, and 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 so. Multiple times during my adolescent life, I would go by and just hang out, and it, it always involved seeing patients. So, of course, he had become sort of a surrogate father for me, and um, and so I wanted to be like him. And um, uh, <clears throat> so these talks went from talking about the birds and the bees to talking about the future and what are you going to be when you grow up. And so he really became sort of um, um, probably the first strong male mentor that I had, one of many. Uh, that I was blessed with. Um, and I think I just kind of wanted to be like him. And so when I first went to medical school, I thought I wanted to be a pediatrician, you know. I was going to ask you, yeah. what, did you want to be a GP or yeah. did you want to well, be a pediatrician? you know, I thought I, I, that's what I had been exposed to. I, I worked in the operating room. Uh, well, I worked in Jefferson Hospital as an orderly. Back then they had orderlies. And, you know, I would change bedpans and change the sheets on the bed, give bed baths <clears throat> to men and Back then, we used to shave everybody before surgery, so that was my job. Um, How old were you? 16, 17. I was in high school. And then um, and then there was an opening in surgery <clears throat> as an orderly in surgery where you'd go clean the operating rooms after the surgeries. And, and I met this uh, orthopedic surgeon, Banks Blackwell, from there. And um, he, I, I've always been pretty obsessive compulsive, so I had the doctor's locker room where the doctors would just leave their shoes everywhere, you know, scrubs everywhere, clothes everywhere. And, you know, I'd organized all that. And he walked in one day and I was stacking the shirts and the pants, <clears throat> scrub shirts and pants. And he said, he said, this is the best this, this room has looked since I've started practicing here. He, he, you know, what's your name? And we started talking and he, he, um, 
later on, he said, um, you know, I was out there watching him scrub his hands and he would go in the operating room. He and his wife, Marlon, would operate together. Wow. And cool. he said, he said, uh, have you ever been in an operating room and seen an operation? And I said, no. He said, well, would you like to? I said, of course. So he went and talked to the supervisor, got me into the operating room. And then he said, have you ever, uh, like his wife was sick one day and she assisted him. And he said, uh, you know, I'm going to go ask Miss McNeil, the OR supervisor, if if you can come in and hold retractors for me. I guess I said, well, I've never washed my hands, you know, never scrubbed. Mm -hmm. He said, well, let me show you how to do that. So he sort of became my, my next mentor. And that was later on in high school. And, um, for surgery, for surgery. Yeah. And so I just loved, I've always loved taking things apart and putting them back together. And my mom liked to restore antiques. And so I helped her do that. And so I love taking things that were, you know, in need of repair and, and repairing them. So I, I worked with him for one whole summer then as his assistant in orthopedic surgery. <clears throat> so I loved, I just loved surgery, loved doing things with my hands. And and so then I thought, well, I love kids. Um, you know, maybe I can just do pediatric surgery. <clears throat> so then when I got into medical school, we rotate through all the different specialties, pediatric surgery included. And I, I just didn't have, I just didn't have the heart for mm. these babies with these mm-hmm. terminal diseases. I just couldn't. You know, I'd end up crying as much as the parents parents did. And and so, <clears throat> um, but I knew I wanted to do surgery at that point. Um, this is way more probably than you want. No, I love <laughs> okay. it. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> I, um, my. So you're in college now or you're in. Re- well, you're, I'm in, in medical school you're now. Medical so school so, at so I went to Hendrix, went, went to Hendrix because, your, because I, undergraduate. that was a great pre-med school at that time. Mm-hmm. And um and then went to um, medical school, mm-hmm. UA, UAMS, mm-hmm. yeah. and uh, there, there has never been a plastic surgery training program there. So I, we got very little exposure to plastic surgery. And there was a, uh, a surgeon that would come over as a guest surgeon because we had to have some exposure to plastic surgery in general surgery <clears throat> just to, to be accredited. Oh, you did? And so... Um, so doctor, you're, you're in there. You're thinking you're going to go into... Um, some some sort of surgery. And, 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 you, and no, no longer ortho, no longer uh, pediatrics. Well, I didn't know, but I, mm-hmm. when I rotated through pediatrics, I just... Okay. It was just hard, really hard So now hard you're rotating me. again. Mm-hmm. So now I'm in general surgery. General surgery. surgery. General surgery. And you okay. rotate I'm through following. pediatric surgery, cardiac surgery, general surgery, you know, that, <clears throat> all the different surgical subspecialties. Um. And one of the chief residents, fifth year residents, was supposed to have scrubbed with Dr. Stuckey. I don't know if you ever knew Dr. Stuckey, John Stuckey, Jim Stuckey, um, one of the senior plastic surgeons, one of the first plastic surgeons here in Arkansas, big time plastic surgeon. <clears throat> he came over and was doing a breast reduction. And only the chief residents got to scrub with him. I was a fourth year resident. But the chief resident that day got called to the ER for a gunshot wound to the chest. And so somebody had to help Dr. Stuckey. So he said, Chris, go in there and help Dr. Stuckey and do this breast reduction. Well, you would never, ever walk into an operating room unprepared, <clears throat> but it was a last minute thing. I didn't have a chance to even look at any operations about how, how you do breast reductions because you get questioned, you know, and you're expected to know about each operation you you work on. <clears throat> because they ask you for advice, what do you think about this? Well, they just say, you know, tell me everything you know about, okay. you know, the anatomy of the breast, the blood supply of the breast and things. So this... This woman, bless her heart, was probably a G cup, double G cup, probably just, Huge. you know, had, and she was not a big woman, you know, and so just had the weight of these her whole life. Um, and so he took her and, you know, I watched him take that patient that had this double G cup and make her just the prettiest little full C cup, small D cup. And what what really got my attention was we sit we always sit the patients up because things look different when you're sitting up right mm-hmm. especially breasts mm-hmm. <clears throat> and he had done one side and he sat her up to sort of compare and make sure that that was what he want wants and I I could see the before and after right there and it was just mind blowing the how much better she looked and I think we took like eight pounds of breast tissue off that one side just one side wow <clears throat> and um, and then, of course, he finished the second side and made him made him look the same. And I t- I took care of this patient afterwards. You know, he would he was just he was in for the surgery, and then I would take care of her afterwards. And even in the recovery room, <clears throat> she felt 
like a new woman. She didn't even ask for pain medicine because she'd been carrying the weight of these breasts around for her whole life. And I saw her back in the, in the clinic <clears throat> as she recovered, and it was just life-changing for her. Yeah. Totally life-changing. She could go to her. I, didn't, I never knew, of course, being a guy, that <clears throat> women that are that large, they can't just go to Dillard's and buy a bra. Yeah. You know, they have to order them. Yeah. And, and they're they were very, on the internet. Very expensive. That was before the internet. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, it was just life-changing for her, and it was a positive thing. For me, so much of general surgery, and I loved general surgery, but so much of general surgery was was cancer related, and so, you know, I just never, I enjoyed the the, the surgical part of it, but I never liked going out and telling the family that mom's breast cancer was metastatic and that you know she was not probably not going to do well, or grandpa's colon cancer had gone everywhere, you know, and that that's what a lot of general surgery is. Um, <clears throat> It's also a way to save people's lives. You know, if somebody's mm -hmm. got an aneurysm and you fix it, then you've saved them. So there's both sides of it. Mm -hmm. But, but um, this is always going to have a positive outcome. Yeah, I think it does. And and it didn't involve cancer and it didn't involve dying. And, and, and so uh, then you went to UCA to do more? You went UCLA. 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 Well, I went, you so I went to UT Southwestern in Dallas to do plastics. So there's not a plastic surgery training program here. So I had to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, um, and that was one of the top. It probably still is one of the top plastic surgery training programs in the country, if not the world. Um, really? So I spent two years there and um, learned as much as I could about plastic surgery there. And I, but I was I was still drawn toward the kids. So at Dallas Children's Hospital, we did a lot of kids with cleft lips and palates and all kinds of birth deformities, spina bifida, um, chest wall deformities, all everything. <clears throat> And so that was sort of my reconnection with kids. And mm -hmm. so I love that part of it. So you, you take a child that has, you know, a terrible cleft lip or a cleft palate where they can't speak and mm -hmm. they, they can't, you know, they when they take liquids, it comes out of their nose. And, no. You know, it's just a terrible mm -hmm. thing. Um, or they're born without an ear or they're born with their eyes really far apart or their mm -hmm. skull misshapen. And, and I really wanted to know, while we got exposure to that at UT Southwestern, it wasn't really enough to go out and feel comfortable doing it. So I um, was fortunate to go to UCLA and spend a year with a guy named Henry Kawamoto, who was, again, world-class craniofacial surgeon. <clears throat> so I spent a year doing that um, and then came back to Arkansas to try to start a training program here. Um, you know, things being what they were at UAMS at that time, uh, it just, after about Five or six years, it was apparent that there was, they were not going to be able to support a training program in plastic surgery. So I was going to go back to Dallas and join the faculty there, but my wife didn't want to move back to Dallas, mm -hmm. and so we stayed. And um, so I stayed at Children's Hospital but went out into private practice. But you're not training people <clears> now, are you? No. Well, I go away and train people, or they come to my office and I train them, but not, a, not like a formal residency training program, which... <clears throat> would be great. And Arkansas really still needs that. I think I see what you're going to do in your retirement. I hope. Yeah. All right. Uh, this is a great place to take a break. We kay. continue our, when we, when we come back, we'll continue our conversation with Dr. Chris Shoemake of Shoemake Plastic Surgery in Little Rock, Arkansas. We are going to talk about beauty procedures and options for women. Learn what sur surgery he recommends most. Are you ever too old to have a <clears throat> facelift? Should men have facelift injections, skin tightening, cool skull? acne control and much more we'll be back to get beautiful and informed after the break flagandbanner.com is so much more than a flag store dress up your address plan a perfect party or throw some pillows on your porch bring in your old u.s flag and get five dollars off a new one hurry down to the flagandbanner.com downtown little rock open monday through saturday listening to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy, a production of FlagandBanner.com. Over 40 years ago, with only $400, Carrie founded Arkansas Flag and Banner. During the last four decades, the business has grown and changed, starting with door-to-door -door sales, then telemarketing, to mail order and catalog sales. And now, a third of their sales come via the internet. This past year, Flag and Banner added another internet feature, live chatting. Over time, Carrie's business and leadership knowledge grew. As early as 2004, she began sharing this knowledge on her weekly blog. And in 2009, she founded a nonprofit Friends of Dreamland Ballroom. And in 2014, Brave Magazine was launched. 
Today, she's branched out to the radio with this very production, podcast, and live stream on Facebook. Each week on this show, you'll hear candid conversations between her and her guests about real-world experiences on a variety of businesses and topics that we hope you'll find interesting and inspiring. If you'd like to ask Carrie a question, share your story, or underwrite any of our past or present shows, send an email to questions at upyourbusiness.org or message her on flagandbanners.com Facebook page. Back to you, Carrie. You're listening to Up In Your Business with me, Carrie McCoy, and I'm speaking today with renowned plastic surgeon, Dr. Chris Shoemake of Shoemake Plastic Surgery and Skin Retreat in Little Rock, Arkansas. Before the break, we got the back history on how this man from Pine Bluff was mentored by doctors when he was a teenager, looked into a faith-filled event that sent him into the surgery room where he learned about plastic surgery and sent him on his life's path that he could have never guessed. And that is so true with so many guests. You just work hard. You never know who's watching. I mean, he was cleaning the scrub. He was cleaning the doctor's uh, room after they scrubbed like the locker room for doctors and did such a good job of cleaning the locker room for the doctors that he ended up in a surgery room. I mean, this is the kind of stuff you never know who's watching. And I hear it over and over again. Just always do a good job. You never know who's watching. You never know where it's going to lead. So he talked about um, how he he loved working for kids. He went from UAMS to Dallas, Texas. After his experience at UAMS, uh, he went to Dallas, Texas, and then he went to UCLA and worked with children with uh, face deformities. Mm -hmm. And now he's come back to Arkansas. He's at UAMS. He's a little frustrated, I guess. So he goes out into private practice. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> trying to start a training program here in, in Arkansas, we've never had one. We're one of a, one of two states that doesn't have one, but you know, just the, the way things were at that time. And even now it's very hard to do that. So, so uh, <laughs> I asked Chris it when right back during the break, I said, well, you're still not training. And he said, well, actually I am. Tell us what you're doing. Well, I think there's a lot of ways that I can still teach people. My nurses, of course, get taught whether oh, they want true. to hear it or not. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, it's always fun to have guests that come and, and hang out. And, uh, you know, I have doctors that come from Dallas and I've, I've heard other you places. do. You have yeah. people that come up and you, and go into surgery with you and you train other people. Yeah, yeah. And, and, um, I also asked him at the break about if he misses working with children and mm -hmm. facial deformities and how, uh, how, um, inspiring that is to help those kids. And you said that you still do. Well, not currently, but I did for about 15 years. I um, <clears throat> went to um, with with um, a group called um, Operation New Life, which Bill Fa Bill Alfonso and I started. It was a um, faith based organization that would go to third world countries and do. Bill Bill is a uh, <clears throat> an amazing oral maxillofacial surgeon, and and with with plastic surgery and as my specialty, and his is as oral maxillofacial. It's a great. Where's he from? Combination. He's from North Rock. Oh. Mm -hmm. And so y'all would go to Honduras and <clears throat> go to Honduras with cleft palates? And, mm -hmm. Yeah, so we went to Honduras uh, to just a little hospital, very, very small hospital there in the mountains. And through a long story, which we probably mm -hmm. don't have time for today, mm -hmm. we, ended, we ended up at um, at the big university there in Tegucigalpa teaching plastic surgery residents, uh, Honduran plastic surgery residents, things that, which, you know, that's what I really wanted to do here, but mm -hmm. couldn't work it out here, so... You know, there were other ways to get around that. So I did that for about 15 years, and we took teams down sometimes twice a year, and that, that was amazing. Because you we, don't do it anymore? You know, Honduras has become, the oh, last last yeah. time I went, oh, they, yeah. the, the doctors that I worked with called and said, Chris, it's just, Too dangerous. Uh, you know, we we one in particular said, I, I, every day when I leave my house, I worry about my wife and children not, mm -hmm. you know, being kidnapped. And so the... Murder rate was the highest at that time in the in the world, and um, I think it still it's is. Just not a not a place that I felt comfortable taking a team to anymore. Yeah, so I agree with that. I miss it though. We we think we talk about it a lot. Well, it'll probably be in your future as you get as you start to retire. <clears throat> if you ever retire, people like you never retire. Uh, so I love what I do. I don't. I got to tell everybody. I don't want to retire. You and everybody listening probably gets the feel of what great bedside manners you have for being so smart <clears throat> and so talented and experienced. You have a great. Uh, bedside manner uh, and in the office, you really are a great listener, which a lot of doctors are not. And you're and you're <clears> fun <throat> and you're cute. And tell everybody what you did when you were in 
he's going to get mad at me for telling me this, just to say, just to show how human you are, what did you do at a football game one time? I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, at a football street. game? No, that was a Hendrix. Yeah, that was oh, a Hendrix. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was uh, that was back when streaking was in. And, it was. And, uh, you know, I had totally forgotten about, I guess I'd repressed that until Tom Smith, the dentist, <laughs> I was sitting in his chair one day and he, he goes, oh, there's something in my office I need to show you. And I, I said, what? He pulls out, there are pictures. Black, oh. Yeah, pictures from, I guess, the annual staff of us. Naked. You know, streaking. Yeah, it was dark, but so you couldn't really see anything. But um, but I could I could see my profile, of course. And uh, <laughs> so he's fun. Oh yeah, it was fun. It was fun. <laughs> that was a long time ago, guys. You, know, you can't do that now. You go to jail. Seventy five. You can't even do all the things you talked about in the first break about uh, going into surgery with people or no. going into the doctor's office. It's just almost. I know it's for the protection of the patients, yeah. but it's almost <laughs> um, sad that we can't have apprentices anymore because <laughs> of fear of being sued by for everything. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we still do. I'll have like I had a little high school student. As long as I ask permission from my patients, you know, I had okay. a little high school student who is 17 years old. She has already decided she wants to be a plastic surgery and a plastic surgeon. And she hung out for three days with me. I got permission from all the patients. She signed all the documents. Oh, we had the best time great. because it was like, it was exactly what someone had done for me, you know, 30 years ago, whenever that was. <clears throat> all right. So it's time to start talking about uh, some of my favorite subjects. Oh gosh! I okay. told everybody also at the beginning of the show <clears throat> that after <throat> I went over here, I went on his website, um, Chris, you make, PlasticSurgery.com, I think it is, mm -hmm. and was reading all the things you can do. And there mm -hmm. are so many things you can do that there I think are. I think I'm not going to landscape my yard, but landscape myself this yeah. summer. <laughs> I mean, there are so many things yeah, you are. can do. A lot of options. You've even started a skin retreat area that has nothing to do with surgery. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's talk about uh, liposuction, which requires surgery, mm -hmm. versus cool sculpting, which okay. your nurses do, okay. right? Yeah. <clears throat> What's okay. the difference between those two? So, um, and when would it be applicable? Which one, when, when would you choose either one? Well, there are a lot of factors carry that determine mm -hmm. that, but, but in general, um, one is, is non-surgical and one is in the operating room. And so it's a matter of degree. So if someone just has areas that they just want to contour, let's say it's in, in women, there's just, there are so many just genetically prone areas, outer thighs, um, around the umbilicus, uh, love that's handles, stomach. That's stomach. Yeah. um, inner thighs, um, upper arms <clears throat> that just, no matter what they do, they come in and they're frustrated. They've, they've, they're doing, they're starving themselves. They're, they're working out, they're doing cardio. They, they're lifting weights and they just can't get rid of these things. These are just genetically predetermined areas that were probably where their mom has mm -hmm. fatty accumulations, where their grandmother mm -hmm. had it, maybe they, um, so if it's a matter of just a little contouring, then that's where cool sculpting is sort of our first Double option. Double chin would be a great one. Double chin in a young in a young patient, mm. right? Oh, okay. Yeah. So you can go in and and we have all these different little applicators that are made for different areas, and you can lay down on a table. We have we have two machines, so we can do both like both love handles at once or both hips at once, whatever it is. You can watch. We have Netflix showing or whatever. And you just lay there. You just lay there. And, and the it, machine, you put the machine <clears> on you? Put the machine on you. It's like a suction cup. So you don't need an attendant to stand there other than to check the machine nope. every so you, often. No, you just, you can sit there and play on your phone or watch television. Read a book. Does read it a hurt? Book. Nope, it doesn't hurt. Why don't everybody do that? Well, <clears throat> because some people aren't good candidates for it, right? So if someone comes in who's really, who really has either loose skin, so it's all, the results of any of these body contouring procedures cool sculpting, liposuction, are all really dependent on skin elasticity. Ah. So if, if someone, if, if a girl, you can have two identical twins come in and one's had babies and she's got stretch marks on her stomach, excess fat, but the skin has a lot of stretch marks, it's loose and you can't really, you know, when you pinch it, it doesn't really just bounce back. Mm -hmm. Then that patient probably is not a good candidate for liposuction or cool sculpting because if you melt the fat underneath it or if they lose weight, if they lose weight, the skin doesn't sh just shrink up like it, you'd want it to if you were mm -hmm. 16. Um, it can hang worse. And so you can create a worse problem mm -hmm. by not doing the right procedure on these patients. Would you do a tummy tuck? You do a tummy tuck on that patient, yeah. Doesn't so those leave big scars? They do. <clears throat> but that's the only way you can get a flat tummy. Is you just you, don't wear a bikini. If you Well, you can. we designed the scars so that they would fit. So I, I, when I'm doing tummy tucks, and I do a lot of those, 
I'll have the patients wear an undergarment or a bathing suit that shows me exactly what pattern they do because it's not so much a factor nowadays. But back when French cut was in, you know, that would that would totally change where the scar would be. And the French cut's up over your hip up for all you guys hips, that yeah. don't know what a French cut but, is. Yeah. Um, so I'll have them wear that the morning of surgery, and I'll mark that with a little surgical marking pen. I'll mark the boundaries of that, and then I'll keep that scar within the boundaries of that. So they could wear that garment. So how big is the scar? It's not very big then. No, it's long. It goes really from hip to hip. Oh, yeah. So this is when you have to be creative. This is artwork. And it, 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 you got to really pull it just right. It's sculpting. Yeah, it's it, it, it sculpting. Really, yeah, but it, but if that same patient came in, let's say her sister came in who had the same exact amount of fat. But the skin was had never been stretched, no stretch marks, where you can you can hardly pinch it, you know, between your fingers, it rebounds right back up there. Then that patient would be a great candidate for either cool sculpting or liposuction. So depending on on how like if they're going to sleep anyway for a facelift mm -hmm. or for breast augmentation or a breast lift, whatever it is, then you're gonna be asleep anyway. You would just do it while they're asleep. But it but if it if they're not going to sleep anyway, <clears throat> then and they don't and don't really have a whole lot of fat, then if they're a good candidate for cool sculpting, then you just cool sculpt. So you lose with cool sculpting, it freezes the fat. And so those fat cells that are frozen just die and your body reabsorbs as they die, they, they slowly die and your body just reabsorbs it. So you can lose probably 30% of the area that you're interested in reducing with, with one treatment. So it requires, like if you've got a lot of fat there, it requires maybe several treatments. <clears throat> um, and then some liposuction, people, you can just go take it some all out. Yeah, it's liposuction, you can take it all out in one setting. And then you can do the tummy tuck at the same time. You could if you wanted to, yeah. yeah. How, how many surgeries hmm. could you pile up on top of each other? Like let's say I wanted to have a facelift and then I wanted to have a tummy tuck mm -hmm. and then yeah. I wanted to have something else. How many <clears throat> hours would you do a long well, surgery? Well, that varies with surgeon, but my... my Depending on the health health of the patient, my my limit is about four and a half hours, because after that the risk of anesthesia goes up, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you're you're under anesthesia the whole time. Mm -hmm. So for cosmetic surgery, just to look better, I can't justify any increased risk <clears throat> of keeping someone to sleep for for longer than about four or five hours. Now, if it's a you know if it's a young otherwise healthy patient, then that may be five hours depending on what you're doing. But if it's an older patient who maybe has you know is in their fifth, late 50s, 60s. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you have to be a lot more careful and, mm -hmm. and we get medical clearance from their doctors if there's any question at all about it. Mm -hmm. So you can, so I, I will do as many things as I can do on that patient as long as they're only asleep about four and a half. Well, I would so get long. worried about you getting tired <clears throat> and not having, a, you know, starting off real fresh and then not mm -hmm. having a good day at the mm -hmm. end of the thing, being like, <laughs> well, oh, my back hurts. I'm tired. Yeah, you just know, cut that shorter and you know, let's get you know, out of it's, here. You know, I've operated when I first went into practice doing birth deformity stuff and, and cancer reconstruction, we would operate for 15, 16 hours at a time. I cannot time. imagine. No, you take breaks, you know, you take breaks and you get something to eat, to eat or you use the bathroom. But, but, but it's amazing what you can do. And just like this interview, you know, eight hours later, you're, you, you look back and you go, wow, this, it seems like we just started. Yeah. Because you're so, so involved in, in the thought process behind what you're doing and, and time just flies. Yeah. You look up and it's been like I do a facelift now. It, you know, and it takes me probably three hours to do just an average type facelift. <clears throat> and it it just seems like I just started. So there's a new thing, skin mm -hmm. tight. Speaking of mm -hmm. facelifts, mm -hmm. skin tight versus facelift. I think mm -hmm. you're going to say the same thing you said mm -hmm. for liposuction and cool mm -hmm. sculpting. Skin tight can only do so much. Yeah, I think I think those conservative, non-surgical things, face tight, body tight, um, and fract tell, tell fractura. Her. There are a lot of new things out. Tell our <clears throat> listeners what skin tight and fractite is, or whatever you just fractite, said. Fractite, yeah, that's a good one. What um, did you say? <laughs> <laughs> that's my made-up word. Yeah. That, um, so, skin tight. What's skin yeah, tight? Yeah. So they stick something in and heat it up, or <clears throat> what is yeah, it? Yeah. So, so all of the ways that we have to tighten skin presently involve creating <clears throat> a some form of injury in the face in a very controlled fashion. Mm -hmm. Whether it's an, like a chemical peel would be putting an acid on the skin, right? Okay. So that's a controlled burn. Right? Oh, I get you. I know. So <clears throat> thermal injury, like actual heat injury, you 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 you. That's all. You heat the underside. Yeah, all therapy is a good example. Mm -hmm. it uses radio and, frequency, and I've done that, and I love it. Just yeah. want everybody to know that one's yeah, a good and one. that's been around for you know ten years, 
So, so you find some way of heating up the underside of the skin or the deeper tissues. Mm -hmm. That creates a thermal injury. And then your body then in turn has to heal that. So just if you've got a burn on your arm, you know, your body will heal that. And as it heals it, you know, those burn scars on your arm are tight. The skin is thick. Oh. And if you biopsy that area, there are there's all kinds of new collagen, new elastin, all the things that we lose as we get older or we have a lot of sun damage. So this is a way to stimulate your body to create its own reconstructive materials, collagen, elastin, ground substance, all the things that, that give you elasticity of your skin. You're just doing it by creating an injury and then letting your body heal it. And it's underneath the skin. <clears throat> underneath so there's the no skin. scarring. When you talk about a burn, you can right. see a scar. This right. is all underneath the skin so all, no one sees it. Right, all underneath the skin. And it just gets <clears throat> angry and mm -hmm. starts creating new cells and sending a lot of energy to that it does. area to it does. plump it up. And these new cells have, um, or this new dermis has young col younger collagen in it that's a lot more, has a lot more elasticity to it. You get mm -hmm. a lot of the, you know, the rebound of your skin back mm -hmm. when you do it. So... Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of different ways to do that. And lately, but it doesn't last a long. I'm sorry, go ahead. Lately, well, what? Well, it, no, I mean, the, it does turn the clock back and it does stop or slow down the process, but the clock still ticks, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, we need to find a way to turn the clock back and have it not still tick. Yeah, you know? well, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and facelifts. Mm -hmm. if, if you, you know, if you've outgrown mm -hmm. all the things we're talking about, skin tight yeah. and alt therapy, and you're like, okay, I really want to get rid of these saggy jowls mm -hmm. or neck and whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, when would you say a facelift was the okay, next so, step? So there's an intermediate in there. So what we're doing by these non-surgical techniques, <clears throat> Fractura, uh, body type, face type, all therapy, all these, is um, we're we're just delaying. We're, we're trying to just buy time. Mm -hmm. And I have patients that, that come in when they're in their late 40s or 50s who say, you know, I, I just, I'm not ready for a facelift, <clears throat> but I want to do whatever I can do to postpone that as long, to look as good as, as, as long as I can. Um, and so you can do these things and just buy time. So all therapy, you'd probably get a year or two, probably buy a year or two. Fractura, you'd probably buy two or three years. And, and What's and fractural? Same fractura is a new thing that's out. That it, it, Have you heard of microneedling or uh -huh. skin pin? Yeah, yeah. That's where they kind yeah. of stick yeah. your face, your yeah. surface of your skin with, with yeah. a... Yeah, so you, you drive these little microscopic, well, not microscopic, very, very small needles into your skin. Which damages it again. Yeah, which creates an injury not only of the outer layer of skin, but now these go deep, oh. deeper, and so it injures the dermis as well. Oh. Hardly any downtime from it. Great for acne scars, great for wrinkles. Um, and just that creates, again, creates an injury. Now, this is a mechanical injury, not thermal not chemical, mechanical injury, <clears throat> um, that your body has to heal. So as it does, it generates all those things that we talked about, collagen, elastin, all those things we talked about. So this company took um, took the microneedling, creating that mechanical injury, and added radio frequency to it. So the tip of the needles, yeah, you need to do this. Oh, I do. <laughs> yeah. My eyes are lightning. <laughs> if, you, if, you like, if you like all therapy, that you'll love this. Oh, okay. So it, the tip of these needles... Um, as soon as you put that needle in there, it gets hot and it's very controlled, you know, temperature it gets very hot. So it creates on the dermal side, the underneath side, a thermal injury. And then you've got the mechanical injury of the, the needles going in. And there's like 25 to 40 needles that go in at one time. You, you don't, you're numb, you don't feel it. I was going to say to you, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, but you can do it with, uh, without going under anesthesia. You can do it in the office with just a little oral anesthesia and also a little numbing cream. Um, and we 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 do nerve blocks, so you can't. You Does your can't, nurse do it, or do you do it? I I do the nerve blocks, but they do the treatment. <clears throat> and it um, lasts three or four years. Well, it hadn't been out, but but probably two or three years. But that's what they're thinking, looking at how much collagen is generated. So, but this is a thing that you know our ability to generate collagen and elastin and all the things we need to maintain elasticity and keep the clock and slow the clock down mm -hmm. changes as we age. Right, so a seventy-year-old can't generate as much collagen as a forty-year-old. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these are. So you can do this on a. Again, you could do this on a forty-year-old patient and her mom who's seventy, and you're going to get different results. Sure. The forty-year-old would respond beautifully to it. You know, the seventy-year-old may not. So would you so give her a facelift? Then, then she would get a facelift. Are you not too no. old when you're seventy? No. No. You all so it's not, back. Oh yeah. I do 70 year olds all the time. It, it's it's not really about age. <clears throat> it's more about health, right? So there are 50 year olds that I 
can't do a facelift on because they've smoked. Had, they've smoked. Or, well, I can't do a facelift on anybody that is currently smoking. But oh, really? But well, that's no. good to know. Yeah, <laughs> but you can't have a facelift. Yeah, but um. I was pointing to somebody in the room oh, okay. for all my radio people. They're yeah. like, who's she talking to? I'm like, yeah. I was pointing to that guy over there. He can't have a face. You, you know, so, I quit smoking, right? Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay. Go Good ahead. Go ahead. So a lot of what we recommend for patients has has to do with what their goals are, what their overall health is, whether they want to go under anesthesia or not. Yeah. What kind of results they expect. <clears throat> um, and their age. So, so Do men have facelifts? Uh, yeah, I do a lot of male facelifts. They don't look weird? N- not they don't have enough fat I, I, on their face. They're they're naturally kind of bony, I think. Well, so some in, some men are, some men aren't. I mean, it. it uh, no, we do quite a few male faces. I think they're probably just as happy, if not happier, than a lot of the girls. It, you know, it's really it's very common. Well, yeah. okay, good. So <laughs> I, let's talk about injections. Okay. So I know everybody's been doing injections, Botox. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I can't think of what are those ones yeah. called? Oh, Dysport. Dysport. Uh, the new one is Juvo. That's going to be the new one that's okay. almost out. Okay. Um, what do you well, think about a, those? So there are these are called um, neurotoxins. Mm-hmm. Botox, Dysport, Juvo, a lot, a lot of different. Um, Volumous or? No, no, that's it. So that's a filler. Oh, that's a filler. Okay. So when that's you talk about right. injections, you talk about neurotoxins, and those are to those are to temporarily diminished muscular activity in your face. So so the scowl lines that you have between your eyebrows, uh-huh. you know, teachers get those a lot because they're constantly, you know, looking at them. people who read a lot, get those. People who, who, who animate a lot, you know, you'll get those. Oh, I should be covered. Parallel okay. lines, you know, between your mm-hmm. eyebrows. <clears throat> those are caused by the activity of two different muscles in there called corrugator muscles. And they kind of run up from your nose like, and they arch over your brow. So you can put some a neurotoxin in there Botox, Dysport, Juvo, one of those, six or seven little bitty injections, tiny needles, and in about a week or two, depending on which one you use, you can't make that expression anymore. And so those wrinkles are, those are expression lines. And so now all of a sudden you can't create that wrinkled brow anymore because it, the muscles are paralyzed. About three or four months later, they wake up <clears throat> and then you have to do it again if you want to keep them paralyzed. But it, it, it was How many some, weeks? Three or four no, months. Months, I'm sorry, months. I was about to say, that's yeah. not worth doing. No, of course not. No, months later. Um, but it gets rid of the, uh, it, it works with crow's feet. It works with smoker's lines. And so then what's the difference between filler? Okay, so filler is to is to restore volume to an area. So as we get older, well, some people don't have cheekbones, for example. They don't have don't strong cheekbones. Don't point at cheek. me, I've got cheekbones. Oh, well, I know you do. <laughs> I'm looking at them. But, um, but some people just don't yeah, have good right. bone structure. Mm-hmm. And so this is a way to... Without having to do a surgical implant, back in the before we had fillers, we used to do cheek implants. We used to do chin <gasps> implants. We used to do Ooh. jaw implants. I mean, these are surgical procedures where you go and you put a piece of silicone or another thing that are shaped like chins or cheeks and big operations. We hardly ever do those anymore because we have fillers. So fillers will contour. It's for contouring of the face. So if someone needs stronger cheekbones, you can just with one single injection of of different various different types, we use Voluma in our office, but there are a lot of different options. Mm-hmm. You can you can give somebody these beautiful cheekbones or a beautiful mm-hmm. chin or a beautiful jawline. And why don't they just put those in, in the boobs office. instead of having to do augmentations? Well, there are people that do it in breasts, but the problem is that they're not permanent. So it's a we're putting fat in breasts now and getting a lot better results <gasps> really? with with uh, than with in people who just don't want an implant. Take it out of one spot, put it in another mm-hmm. spot. That yeah. is sculpting. That is art. It is. It's All right, really I want cool. to tell everybody who we're talking to. We're not going to go to a break because there's too much to talk about. But I do want to tell everybody that uh, you're listening to Up In Your Business with me, Carrie McCoy, and I'm speaking today with renowned plastic surgeon, Dr. Chris Shoemake of Shoemake Plastic Surgery and Skin Retreat <laughs> in Little Rock, Arkansas. We've been talking a lot about the skin retreat. And I also want to tell people that they're uh, listening to KABF, the voice of the people. Do you want to take phone calls? Sure. If yeah. you want to take phone calls, we want to take one. Sure. Jason, give them the phone number. 501-433-0088. If you could do one treatment for yourself, <laughs> what would it be? One treatment for myself. Okay, not for yourself, for anybody. If you could do one treatment on one person Mm -hmm. and you said i have done every kind of treatment there is and almost everybody could use this what would it be well um 
Well, I think probably the most dramatic, I mean, I, I'm kind of a facial, I love facial stuff. I, I do whole body stuff, but I love facial stuff. So based on my training and, you know, I'm just really comfortable in the face. I think prob probably what I do the most of now, two or three a week are facelifts. Two or three facelifts a week. Yeah. Yeah. So that's. What's the risk of doing a facelift? Well, you know, fortunately, it's it's rare to have a problem with a facelift. Um, I guess the biggest risk would be bleeding if. You know, the reason that we can do all the stuff that we do to the face is because the blood supply is so amazing to the face. You can never stretch that skin or change the shape of that skin anywhere else in the body except in the face <clears throat> because it has an abundant blood supply. It's, what we do is totally limited by blood supply. So when there's a lot of blood supply, you, can, you have more options. Um, and that's why a tattoo won't hold on your face because of the blood supply. It yeah, eventually it, yeah. just disappears. Yeah. So you can do things to recontour the face, uh, turn the clock back on the face that you, you know, that are incredible. And um, using a lot of fat injections now, stem cell related things, not stem cells themselves, but um, a lot of the products that are in fat are, are rejuvenative and uh, regenerative. And so... So when you do the facelift? Yeah, we do almost always do... Some fat in Volume replacement with fat. So if you're, if this is another one of those either or things, if you need cheekbones... You, and, and that's all you need. You're not going to the operating room anyway. You're just in the office. <clears throat> we just open a syringe of Voluma or whatever we're using on cheeks, and you numb up the skin, and you inject it, and all of a sudden you have cheekbones. But that lasts about a year, sometimes two, depending on what you put in. Um, if you're going to the operating room for a facelift and you need cheekbones, then we use fat. So we'll suction fat from your tummy or your hips or wherever you have any extra fat, and we put it through this long purification process and isolate just the pure fat cells. And then I inject those using a little blunt needle in every place that you would do it in the office if they were awake. But the, this is their own fat. And so it's permanent. They don't, you don't absorb it. <clears throat> so when you go in there to put stuff in your face and they've mm -hmm. been doing injections and mm -hmm. all these things, do you see all those injections when you lift uh, their face up? You, you can, yeah. But usually we ask them to wait. So if, if someone's having a facelift, we ask them to hold off on any injections. For how long? Well, as long as they can. So six months if they can. So mm -hmm. that's some people. Um, what about the scars when you have a <clears throat> facelift? I always worry about that and the numbness of your face. Yeah. So the numbness is temporary. That, you know, that's why facelifts really don't hurt very much. At least my patients tell me they really don't hurt very much. But they're because you're, you're, you're cutting all those tiny little pain nerves when you lift the skin up. You cut those. The downside of that is you're numb for... Up to a year. No matter what kind of <clears throat> facelift you do, you do that? Well, there's all kinds of facelifts. I know. Carrie. There's one where you cut the muscle. Well, you don't cut the muscle in any facelift. But you, you But you tighten the muscles. Yeah, that's the kind I do. So you tighten the muscles because you get... You know, the muscles result. elongate as you get older, you know, especially mm -hmm. facial muscles. So you tighten those muscles. Um, and that makes, a, that makes a facelift last much, much, much longer when so, you do that kind. Oh, so facelifts don't necessarily last? Well, no, well, nothing's permanent, Carrie. <laughs> I know, <laughs> but, but, but no, depending on the facelift. So the kind of facelift that I do, in you know, in a let's say in a sixty-year-old, okay, would probably last ten to twelve years. Well, you're, it seems like you're going to always look better. Ten, you do. I well, mean, yeah, even at twelve years, like I'll see patient. I saw a patient back yesterday that was thirteen years after a facelift, and she still looked better than her pre-op pictures from her facelift thirteen years ago. But she's but she's aged. I mean, you know, yes, again. well, of course. Yeah. But it seems like you would always look a little bit younger. You would. Oh, so yeah. one time I was telling you I was scared of a facelift, and I said, "You said," and I said, "What if we don't do hardly anything but just cut the skin right behind my ears and just pull the skin up?" Mm -hmm. Well, that mm -hmm. would be a that would be probably the most minimal facelift. Mm -hmm. And and you know, for some people, that's all they want because they're afraid of being overdone. And they they hold their they hate, they take their fingers and they put them on their cheeks and their jaw and they pull it back a little bit and they go, "This is all I want." Yeah. So I do those too. I don't do many of those because they don't last very long. You know, Carrie, and you know when you're when you're dependent totally on the skin to hold everything up. Skin when you're 60, skin hasn't got a lot of elasticity, so it tends to just stretch back out. So you may get three or four years out of that. Now, to some patients, that's okay. That's they just they're doing it for their their kid's wedding, or they don't care if they look good 12 years from now. They just want to look good for the wedding, and and for whatever event that is. Yeah. So there's really a facelift for everybody. Younger patients come in, like I've got 40-year-olds that are starting to see jowls and they're yeah. starting to see some laxity in their neck, and they don't need a full-blown facelift. They just need a little a little bit of skin tightening. And I used to not do those at all. You know, when That's I trained when I trained, 
they would they would say you just need to tell that patient to come back when they when they really really need it a full facelift. But I had patients that, and I would tell them all the reasons why it wasn't going to last very long. And you know these patients, these forty year old patients would look at me and they go, well, if it's an hour long operation and it doesn't hurt and there's not much downtime and, and there's not much bruising, I don't mind doing it again in four years. There you go. And then what I found, so I you know I'd do it and they were happy. Yeah. <clears throat> what I found was that. They would come back in four or five years, and they'd start to see a little laxity again. Then we'd tighten it again, another little mini, I call it a mini facelift. Mm-hmm. And then they, they would come back 10, 15 years later, and they didn't need they still didn't need a big facelift because they'd been doing little, little things along the way. Mm. And so, and people would tell them, gosh, honey, you just look like you don't ever age. I mean, what? <laughs> because there's, they've never had a period where they had two or three weeks of downtime from mm-hmm. a major facelift. And so, you know, now I'm not as... Uh, yeah, you're reluctant to do that. Anymore, well, good. So, so uh, if you had to pick a surgeon, <laughs> is there a red flag if somebody's going in? They've got to pick a surgeon. Is there a way that uh, you're, you should tell our listeners that you know don't pick a surgeon if, or how can you tell a good well, surgeon? Let's approach that the other way. Yeah, how can you tell a good surgeon? I, I think by looking at their work. I mean, I wouldn't look at ads. You know, people will put. <clears throat> There's so much Photoshop that goes into these pre and post op pictures that people publish. You know, I, I would. What, what we do is we don't really show a lot of pictures because I, I don't have my personally my patients don't really want their pictures out there so we don't have a big album of these amazing results because my patients don't want their you know this is Arkansas it's not LA and they don't want their they may know who who's so looking do at their your pictures. research by so I think talk like what we, what I'll do is I'll, I'll say if you want to talk to someone who's had a facelift who's your age kind of looks like you your bone structure, I'll call them or I'll get one of my girls to call them and, and, and ask if it's okay if you visit with them. Mm-hmm. They can learn a lot more. And then if that patient says, I don't care if they look at my pictures, you know, I've talked to her on the phone. And sometimes these patients will actually come for that patient's facelift. Oh. And, and just, just because they bond, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's the best way to get the best information is you talk to, you, you look at people who've been, who that surgeon has done. Yes. You ask if, you, if they would go to that surgeon again. Um, I think the worst way is to is to look in an ad in a magazine and say, "Oh my gosh, look at these before and afters," because that implies that every patient's going to get that result, and we don't always get great results. You know, yeah. even I don't always get great results because really? it depends on what you start with, and it depends mm-hmm. on their skin, and it depends on so many factors. So, how do people get in touch with you? Well, they can. Google our website. I guess my, my website is not very good. We're re- redoing well, I it. I think it's fabulous. Well, we're redoing it. It's. And, it's and uh, I will say it loads <clears throat> slow. It yeah. does load slow. Well, it was interesting when I left. Uh, we started the skin retreat back about six years ago, and I, I left the group that I was in. And for three years, I didn't have a website. <clears throat> and I was bu- as busy, if not busier, during those three years than I ever was. So I'm kind of wondering if I even need you a website. You don't need one. But You're never going to retire either. Well, I've got a 14-year-old. I can't retire. You do? That's so sweet. <laughs> I do. I you got that. like 10 kids. How many kids do you have? Five kids. That's enough. Yeah. Uh, you're never going to retire. I used to uh, worry about if I ever yeah. decide, whenever I decide to get a facelift, that you were going to retire and I wasn't going to get to use you, but you're never you know, going I to. Don't, I don't know what I, I, I don't play golf. I do fly, but that, you know, I can do that anytime. But yeah. um, I love what I do. And, we're, you know, I, I think I'm, I think I'm a better surgeon than I've ever been. And so I, why would I retire? Mm-hmm. You know, I love it. I love my patients. I, I love trying new things. You know, I love teaching. So, mm-hmm. you know. so let me tell their listeners that it's Chris Shoemaker, and he spells both of his names really weird. So Chris is with a K. <laughs> you thank my mom for that. <laughs> <laughs> and Shoemake is is S H E W M A K E. Chris, you thank my Shoemake. dad for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Somebody needs to teach your family how to spell. I know. Mm-hmm. So uh, you can uh, Google him or you can go to flagandbanner.com and uh, we will have a link <clears throat> to his website and you can call and get one of his beautiful assistants to uh, do a consultation with you. Chris will come in and spend forever talking to you. I have a gift for you. You All thought right. I had this as a prop, but it's for you for your office. Oh, it's a desk set of the Arkansas and U.S. flag Perfect. for you to put in your office. Thank you Flags, so much. Flags, who knew? I know, right? <laughs> Thank you so much for coming Thank on. Thank you. That was fun. It was fun. It flies by. Yeah. Uh, who's our guest next week, Jason? Grammy Award winning songwriters <laughs> Steve Dean and Don Goodman from Operation Song. This is right. the coolest group. They contacted me. They're operationsong.org. You probably all know Steve Dean's music. He is a Nashville... Uh, 
writer, songwriter. He's written six number ones. Listen to this. <laughs> Watching You by Rodney Atkins. It takes, a lot, it takes a Little Rain for the Oak Ridge Boys. Southern Star for Alabama. Roundabout Way for George Strait. Hearts Aren't Made to Break for Lee Greenwood. And Walk On for Reba McIntyre. Wow. He's on wow. next week. And he and his co-partner, Don Goodman, have, are, are uh, veterans. And they started a veteran program where they go in and they interview veterans. And these veterans tell them things about their lives that they've harbored forever. A friend of mine did it, Bruce Wesson, told him all about Vietnam. He was a photographer in Vietnam. He told them things he never even told his wife, and they wrote a song for him. And then they're going around the country and paying it forward, and they wanted to come be on the radio show because they wanted to share what they're doing. They're going to start a movement operation song here in Arkansas. So that's going to be a great show. I've never met these guys, but I can't wait to hear from them. And if you want to go hear some of their stories and or hear some of their songs, it's operationsong.com. Org. If you have an entrepreneurial story that you would like to share with us, there's a way. Jason will tell you how. You can send us a brief bio to questions at upyourbusiness.org, message Carrie on flagandbanner.com's Facebook, or make a comment on her blog. Yep, I'm, I'm on all of those every day. To our listeners, I want to thank you for spending time with us. If you think this program has been about you, you're right, but it's also been for me. Thank you for letting me and us fulfill our destiny. Our hope today is that you've heard or learned something and that whatever it is, it's been enlightening and will help you up your business, your independence, or your life. I'm Carrie McCoy, and I'll see you next time on Up In Your Business. Until then, be brave and keep it up. You've been listening to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy, a production of flagandbanner.com. If you miss any part of the show or want to learn more about UIYB, go to flagandbanner.com and click on Radio Show. Like us on Facebook or subscribe to her weekly podcast wherever you like to listen. All interviews are recorded and posted the following week with links to resources you heard discussed on today's show. Underwriting opportunities available upon request. Carrie's goal is to help you live the American dream.